Okay, here we start. Um, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today's session. My name is uh, Liton Kamrujjaman. I am an Associate Professor of Urban Planning and Design at Monash University. Before we begin the session, uh, we acknowledge and pay respect to the people of the Kulin Nations, the traditional owners of the land on which Monash University is located. At the Faculty of Art, Design and Architecture, we acknowledge Aboriginal connection to material and creative practice on these lands for more than 60,000 years and celebrate their enduring presence and knowledge. The Festival of Urbanism is co-sponsored by Monash Urban Planning and Design, along with Henry Heller and Trust, the University of Sydney. The annual Festival of Urbanism is a series of conversations where researchers, practitioners, community advocates, and industry leaders come together to debate the challenges and opportunities facing our cities. Thanks for joining today's special event future transport, how autonomous vehicles and smart mobility will transform Australian cities. Throughout this event, we'll explore how future transport will impact Australian cities and how our cities are preparing to address such challenges. Today's session will follow this following order. In the past 30 minutes, uh, we'll have four speakers. We'll be talking roughly about uh, seven minutes, seven to eight minutes, each of them. And then there will be an open question and answer session. Uh, uh, all participants are requested to put your chat question in the chat box. If you would like to direct your question to a particular uh, panel member, please write your name and write the name of the panel member you would like to ask the question. And following that question and answer session, I will end this session. So we have four panel members, as I said earlier. Uh, we have Dr. Alison Stewart, Associate Professor Crystal Legacy, Mr. Damon Rao, and Professor Graham Curry. Although we initially aimed to have Dr. John Stone, uh, but he fell off from his bike and is undergoing surgery this week. So our prayers go to Dr. John Stone. But this creates a great moment to talk about transport. Will the future transport leave us with no injuries, for example? So Dr. Stewart is the Deputy Chief Executive Officer of Infrastructure Victoria. Dr. Legacy is an Associate Professor of Urban Planning at the University of Melbourne. Mr. Rao is a Senior Transport Planner in the City of Melbourne. And Professor Kari is a Professor of Public Transport at Monash University. We are keen to hear about their current work, key lessons learned for and Australia and the way where we are heading to. So our first speaker today is Professor Graham Kari. I will ask Professor Graham to start with by answering a simple question. How will autonomous vehicles affect our cities? Thanks, Graham, Leighton. Uh, well, I guess uh, my answer to the question firstly is what's an autonomous vehicle? Um, these are trial services at the moment. Um, and their long term future in the cities is, of course, unclear at the moment because there are many types of services. For example, today, I can say rather than how will autonomous vehicles change cities, I could ask how are they changing cities today? Well, we have a proliferation of autonomous trains. Uh, more than 40 percent of all trains in Asian cities have no driver. Uh, they are supremely efficient. They reduce operating costs by 30%. They can run higher frequency services more environmentally efficiently. And that is changing cities by making mass transit more attractive. Uh, it is improving services, making them socially acceptable, improving them in densities. Of course, I think your question was really geared towards autonomous cars which again are uh, more uh, problematic because we don't have them yet. We have a few trial vehicles in places. There are no solid services yet and we don't know how they'll be developed. Indeed, there's two types of autonomous cars in the future. There's private cars that people would own themselves. Um, and then there's shared cars. Uh, private cars are problematic because they just endure car dependence. 
Um, and, you know, those that can afford them would be using them. Um, uh, now, uh, also shared cars, however, like shared public transport, are more efficient and could be used by a wider set of groups. So there are, there are a lot of questions before I can answer the question. In terms of how the future will be changed if autonomous cars become successful, uh, now we've been doing research on the topic. Um, with a couple of very clear answers so far. Again, they're all speculative because it depends on how they operate. But one of the things that's quite interesting is we think that if they did operate, they would have a very big impact on city centres. Because at the moment, certainly in Australian contexts, city centres are dominated by parking. And an autonomous car uh, could well not require parking. If it's privately owned, the vehicle drop could drop the driver off and then go somewhere else. Uh, one of the problems of that is that vehicle would end up doing trips empty. Um, and the last thing our roads need is more travel in cars that are empty. Um, in fact, one of the big Australian problems of cities is our car occupancy has been falling. In fact, shared mobility, so-called shared mobility, has been acting to reduce car occupancy because Services like Uber, actually, uh, uh, most of the uh, high proportion of the time are traveling around without any passengers. Um, so uh, that's not helping congestion in cities. But if we can remove parking in city centers, that high value land can become very valuable and used for alternative purposes. A very interesting future for city centers, we could use that land for more productive uses, uh, such as, you know, a residential and people would have built to walk to activities. Uh, and, you know, certainly Australian cities have uh, more commercial heartlands and the idea that we could actually uh, get more activity through things like people being able to walk to activities would be very attractive, particularly if it was including people that uh, couldn't afford to live in, in city centres. But it's not all good news, I'm afraid. Um, and one of the clear downsides of autonomous cars into the future will almost certainly be uh, that they could encourage longer distance travel. Because as long as the scale economies uh, prove out uh, for their widespread use, they can encourage people to travel further, which is certainly not we, what we need. Uh, and this would make the idea of traveling further, living further away at, at uh, cheaper uh, residences, uh, 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 and, you know, price of residence does uh, decline as we further we get out to the city. Now, that could well include uh, involve longer distance travel, more travel, um, and, and that could make urban sprawl a bigger issue for Australian cities. So that's my potted outcome of these. I mean, I think uh, the, the long term speculations with autonomous cars are unclear. What we have is today in the reality of the world, we have autonomous trains with mass travel really being very successful. I think we should be taking that lesson into the future and uh, being concerning ourselves more with the future around uh, autonomy for mass transit systems than we should be for private cars, which have long caused problems in our cities. So that's my potted history of what I think uh, about that question. Thank you. You're on mute. So that's a brief and great summary, Graham. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have both positives and negatives as well, right? Um, uh, in terms of negatives, traveling further, living in like good houses, uh, it's the trade-off that people will be making, right? But uh, in addition to autonomous vehicle, we have other types of vehicle that will be coming in our cities that are future transport. And one such is e-scooter that is being piloted currently in Melbourne. And our next speaker is Mr. Damon Rao. And my question to Damon is, is Melbourne ready to roll out an e-scooter program? What are the challenges and opportunities? Damon, over to you, please. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thanks very much for having me. Um, 
That's a great question. And I've just put the questions up here at the start to kind of guide my seven minutes. But um, but I'm going to talk, I know everyone wants to hear all of the details about the scooters that are in Melbourne at the moment. I'm going to talk half about that, but then also half about the context that they sit within, a lot of what Graham's talked about, um, and the strategy that we have at the City of Melbourne, um, both before the scooters came along and how we will deal with future transport more generally. So in short answer to the first question, is Melbourne ready to roll out an e-scooter program? Uh, there's kind of two answers to that. Firstly, uh, it's it's coming whether you're ready or not. You really, um, you have to react, you have to be ready to react to what's happening because you don't really get to decide when new transport gets invented. Um, and the the second answer to that is yes, we are ready. And, and that is because we had done the research and developed the strategy um, to be prepared for the impacts of new transport. But first, uh, I will talk about um, some positives about the e-scooter trial because um, it is uh, arguably the most successful trial that we've had in Australia, um, possibly even more broadly. We have been absolutely overwhelmed with demand. This is a, um, is a map showing all of the e-scooter trips that we've had in Melbourne since the 1st of February, since the trial started. We're now up to about 1.7 million trips. Um, it's taken other cities around the world um, much, much longer to achieve these numbers of trips and with many, many more scooters required. We started with a very low number of e-scooters. We were very, uh, we have been very cautious in Victoria. We have the lowest speed limit in the state. Uh, sorry, we have the lowest speed limit in the country. We have the highest age limit in the country. We have the strictest drink driving rules. We're the only state um, where they're not allowed on footpaths and now other states are following. Um, and in, and the lowest numbers of vehicles as well. And in spite of all that, now we have extremely high demand per vehicle. Um, and, and we're now trying to kind of cope with the popularity of that. But we are very aware um, that we are very early in the hype cycle for e-scooters. And this is one slide that hasn't yet come up. Um, I don't have it in this deck because I was almost certain that Graham was going to have it in his slides. But this is about the cycle that we go through with all new technology. And I would encourage you to look up the City of Melbourne transport strategy and look it up on page 42. Um, and it is something we have experienced with everything and especially driverless cars, where at the very beginning of a process, uh, you have this peak of inflated expectations and we are promised everything in the world and and things skyrocket we see it in in all technology not just transport we see it with cryptocurrency and so on so um and then and then you have the big crash where reality sets in and your um the promises haven't necessarily been delivered and then round two um the, the value that is hiding there in whatever new technologies there are will come out and it will find a settling point in reality. And I think probably what we've tried to do in Victoria is that we try to skip the first part because we were the last, the second last state to embark on an e-scooter trial. And I think that is because we were the first people to suffer the O-bike uh, situation. So we paid our penance uh, and we were subjected to something that had high promises. Uh, so now we've been very cautious moving forward. Um, and part of that caution, sorry, I'll just point out this slide is from our open data portal that you can view at the URL that's on the slide there. So very quickly, just about the e-scooters, the trial is led by the Victorian government. E-scooters were illegal before they changed the laws and they were required to change the law before that was possible. Uh, there have been 1.7 million trips this year. And as I said, arguably, it's the most successful trial in Australia. You just have to define success. Uh, private use is still illegal, and that is quite unfair for the owners of private scooters, but that is part of the precautionary approach. And that is part of the experience that occurred in Brisbane with a lot of accidents very early on when they started four years ago. And um, the outcome of the trial ultimately will inform whether or not the government has the courage to, to move forward. So I'm gonna take a few quick steps back. This is more about transport and not about e-scooters, but 
um, normally in a room with people who can put their hands up, I uh, would say, do you recognize this city and whereabouts in the world do you think it might be? Um, in absence of being able to see hands and have people yell out the names of streets, this is actually Melbourne. And that is Flinders Street Station in the background. And in the rush to modernize Melbourne in the 1950s, this was the old fish markets on Flinders Street, uh, we turned it into a car park for 50 years. And there are a lot of examples of decisions that we have made in transport and in other things over the years where we are trying to adapt and change the city to enable new technology. And those exact words appeared in a, trans, in, a, in a strategy document in the city of Melbourne that said, we would adapt and change the city to enable future transport technology. And after we read that and after it was published and after it was too late, I said, by, by that uh, logic, um, by that logic, you would knock down a heritage building to put in electric vehicle charging. So what we really need to do is we need to say that the city has to come first before we adapt and change things for the sake of new technology. So we do need to trial things and pilot things on a small scale before we get too excited and make too many changes. And that is fundamentally the principle of the transport strategy in the section that we have in our new transport strategy that is all about new technology. It says you need to put the city first and you need to tread carefully and um, I'll leave that for people to look up. Uh, it's, it's quite extensive. Um, so I guess those are the challenges and opportunities. Uh, that's my seven minutes. Thank you, Damon. Thanks very much. Uh, so yeah, we, will, we would like to hear about how to measure success later on. Um, probably not only me, but everybody would be interested to know about that. So hopefully we'll have some time for you to answer that question later on. So we'll move to uh, a little bit of different topic in terms of governance of the future transport. We know there will be big challenges in terms of regulations, new laws, deployment, and so on. And we are very fortunate to have Crystal today. She is a kind of uh, governance guru in Australia, I would say. Uh, Crystal, over to you. I have a specific question to you. How ready is our governance to have autonomous vehicles in our cities? Thanks, Lytton, and thanks, everyone. Let me just quickly share my screen with hope that it works and technology is on my side. Um, okay, here we go. Um, well, first, before I begin, I just want to acknowledge that I am speaking to you on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging, and also any Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders, peoples who are here with us today. I also just want to acknowledge the limits of, of the settler colonial governance state to address uh, the challenges of transport planning on unceded lands. Um, and also the limits of uh, a technological and managerial insight into the problems confronting us with transport. So I come into this space thinking about governance and I think it is something that needs to be foregrounded in our conversations about the emerging transport transition, the transition that we're in at the moment, the critical period we find ourselves in. And as we foreground governance, thinking about what is, what is it that we are talking about and essentially, we're talking about the movement of people and goods. Um, and to bring in Damon's comment um, in the earlier presentation, that we foreground the city and its inhabitants in these conversations that we have. Just want to acknowledge my collaborators, Carrie Curtis, John Stone, Louise Reardon, and Shell Ma. Uh, this research is funded through the Australian Research Council. Um, and if you're interested in joining us in some of the conversations we're having, I invite you to join the Progressive Planners Network. Now, when we think about uh, the transport transition that we find ourselves in, these are political questions. This is essentially a political process. And at the foreground of this political process should be, ought to be a question around who wins and who loses. Because we know in planning that there are often trade-offs. It's a political process regarding the distribution of finite resources. And we know in the context of the, the um, arrival of the car that it 
introduced unintended consequences. So one of the challenges that we face is how do we think strategically about this transition and what are the tools available for us to do that now and here. Now to present a fairly bland, but I, rec but I reckon a fairly instructive diagram, we are situated in a series of points, a series of tension points in this transition. We've got, the, we've got along the x-axis, the transition or the tension around collective versus shared transport, so that's public transport, and individual and private transport, so the car. On the y-axis, we have a tension between public ownership, state-led, local government-led, national government-led, versus private operation or private ownership, and that we might see through the emergence of an organization like Uber. So this is the tensions that we're kind of grappling with when we think about the governance of transport. And as you can see by this rather bland diagram, that there are many different scenarios and possible pathways into the future. There is the risk that we might just exacerbate, exacerbate and perpetuate uh, individual car-based mobility. And in the context of climate change and our effort to decarbonize, uh, it might be that we want to plan more strategically and intentionally around how we might move towards one of the other quadrants where we might see public transport being uh, prioritized in this future that might that this future around automation and electrification. But the big question before us here in Australian cities and certainly here in the context of Victoria, where I conduct much of my research, is a governance landscape that is hybridized. We have a very strong private sector uh, that has been uh, enabled and extended through privatization, through deregulation, um, of, uh, and the centralization of power as well. And these present some really tricky challenges for us when we think about how we might guide and participate actively in the shaping of this future. So as part of the work, we've been interviewing public and private sector planners, the so people who are working both within the marketplace and those who are, who are working within the bureaucracy, and we're asking them questions around how are you thinking strategically about this future, if at all? And here we have just a couple of quotes. They're very long quotes, but I'll kind of um, paraphrase them very quickly. This coming from one of our private sector interviews, which I think is really illustrative of this kind of call towards planning that moves us beyond technology, beyond just focusing on uh, the solution to our transport woes being that of a technological innovation. And here in this quote, there is a, a, an acknowledgement that government plays a really pivotal role. And to suggest that we must sit back and just let uh, whatever technology emerges before us is in the, uh, in the view of this interviewee, a cop out. That we must plan with some degree of certainty. And what we're seeing from interviewees in the private sector is that uncertainty is what is being demanded uh, from the public sector. Um, so thinking about what are the regulatory instruments, policy instruments, financial instruments that could be introduced to help steer and guide this transition. But we also want to acknowledge the challenges. We, we do have the governance landscape we've got and within it some significant challenges. So the capacity of the public sector to understand the drivers that motivate the private sector behavior is, is incredibly important. Um, but we also, also acknowledge that lots of the expertise currently resides in the private sector um, through a, a number of decades of privatization. So they hold the expertise. So the question then before us is how do we partner? How do we, how do we shape this hybrid governance environment and landscape in a way that serves the needs of the city of inhabitants and certainly in the context of climate change and climate change action? So this is the landscape we are situated within, um, some of the challenges we face. So the question I, I present, uh, uh, it's sort of a conceptual question, but perhaps a call for us to consider is, do we need to move towards an anticipatory form of governance? So one that learns from the mistakes from the past, that acknowledges those histories and those stories, one that acknowledges the current limitations of our contemporary problems and governance systems, and one that can evolve to serve the needs of the, sorry, serve the changing needs of urban inhabitants 
um, and one that centers the transport transition in the context of climate change action, which is grounded in justice. So these are some of the some of the questions that we are currently grappling with in the context of uh, this this uh, transport transition. We do think that governance lies at the heart of how we move through this this time. And part of that is to surf it and to break open. What is it about the current practices of transport planning and its governance that aren't serving our cities well today? There's lots of research out there to highlight the power and growth of, of big monopolies and big corporates who are coming into this space. The, the challenge is transparency and accountability. Who is the person responsible when things go wrong? And what is the role of government to guide and shape and think strategically? Now, we know here in Victoria, we've got some significant challenges as it relates to strategic planning, particularly in the transport infrastructure space. Uh, so this is something that we need our planners to jump into and, and to help guide and shape. And we need to do that in a collective sense, because to really shake up the governance system, the one that we have before us requires leadership and it requires a lot of courage. So I'm going to end my my seven minutes there, and I look forward to the discussion that uh, that comes ahead. Oh, thanks, Crystal. This is a great definition, I think so, and that partially answer one of the question that we already have in the in the chat uh, from Ian uh, asking about what is uh, smart mobility. So you kind of answer your definition kind of answers that question, but we'll come back to that later on, Ian. Uh, our next speaker today is Dr. Alison Stewart from Infrastructure Victoria. Alison will be talking about our readiness in, in, in terms of infrastructure for uh, future mobilities, autonomous vehicles, zero emission transport. Alison, over to you, please. Thanks so much, um, Leighton, and thanks to the other speakers as well. Um, really interested to be here today and certainly a lot to draw on from the other speakers really interesting i find already just hearing the conversation about how each of us is um looking at slightly different elements of this um of this quite thorny question um so i'll speak today specifically about what infrastructure is required to pave the way for highly automated and zero emissions vehicles in victoria in case people aren't aware infrastructure victoria is the government's um, independent advisory body on all matters related to infrastructure um, and we have three key roles one of which is preparing a 30-year strategy um, which is refreshed every three to five years the second of which is independent advice to government um, on specific infrastructure questions that they have and the third is a research program um, on infrastructure related issues um, so specifically, I'm going to talk to one of our advice projects in detail, um, which I was the project director of around automated and emissions vehicles infrastructure specifically, but I'll also be drawing on some of the research more broadly that we've done at IV, um, as well as some of the recommendations that you may have seen in our strategy if you're familiar with them. Um, I think just as a starting point, and certainly this will have come through from some of the speakers as well, um, it would really be difficult to understate, I think, the potential for automated and zero emissions vehicles to really change the way that we think about the infrastructure requirements for our cities. Um, I note that we consider um, AVs and ZEVs are likely to come um, in tandem with each other. So as we see this transitioning happening um, to some of the, um, the new transfer technologies that, that Crystal was really referring to, we are likely to see that um, as zero emissions vehicles come in because the newer technologies that we have in vehicles tend to incorporate more automated elements to them at the same time, that until we start seeing more uptake of those zero emissions vehicles, we're also unlikely to see significant introduction of automated technologies. So those, those two technologies are likely to emerge together. Um, some of the impacts, of course, will be beneficial um, potentially for individuals government, but, but others will be very detrimental. And what we really want to make sure is that we're thinking about those carefully and making the right decisions as and, and informing government well on exactly what the structure of, of that progress is. So um, we we've made policy recommendations specifically to the Victorian government on what infrastructure might be required, um, firstly, to enable the operation of highly automated vehicles. Um, secondly, in response to the ownership and market models, and Graham spoke to this a little bit that, you know, and, and Crystal also touched on it, the difference between private and shared is actually quite significant in terms of the implications for our infrastructure requirements going forward. And then finally, for zero emissions vehicles as a high proportion of the Victorian fleet and how that might um, fit in. 
So what we did um, in this uh, in this space was we started with a scenarios approach, um, and we really touched on. Um, we took seven different scenarios, which are really extreme scenarios. We really pushed these to the um, the full extent of of how far. How, what would the future look like if we did see any of these scenarios in their entirety being achieved? Now, obviously, that's an unrealistic expectation. We're never going to see 100% um, uptake of, of only, um, uh, well, potentially we would, but only automated and shared vehicles, right? That's that's not necessarily a realistic expectation, but it helps us to articulate to the government, you know, in any of these scenarios, these are the good next steps to take. And here are the kinds of things that you want to be watching for before you make some of those next decisions about what, what you invest in. The seven different scenarios look at different combinations of driving modes, so whether it's um, automated or, um, or human-driven vehicles or non-automated. Um, the power source, so we look specifically at electric, hydrogen, um, and then a continuation of petrol and diesel and what that would do in terms of differences to our infrastructure sector. And then those combinations of ownership and market models. So do we have 100% um, privately owned vehicles, as you can see in those first couple of models, or do we have actually 100% shared? Um, and what would, that, what would the implications of that look like? Um, dead end is our base case scenario. So that's if our current vehicle te technologies continue um, to progress. Um, and basically we don't see any of the inherent vehicles, which helps us to really um, calibrate the differences. Um, the most different scenario is Fleet Street, which is really um, looking at fully automated, fully shared, fully electric um, vehicle fleet and what that would do. And the others are really a combination, including slow lane, which is exactly 50-50 of those two scenarios. This really does give us an ability to really test in each of these different scenarios what, what actually happens. We then did an analysis where we looked across um, 10 different um, areas of infrastructure to really try and unpick for each of those different scenarios, what would the differences be? Um, and this is everything from um, the energy implications for those different scenarios, socioeconomic implications, and how that then, um, of course, from our lens impacts on infrastructure, transport engineering, so what changes need to make to our roads, um, ICT, and really trying to pull, pull apart, you know, what will be different about um, the ICT required to support these technologies in addition to traditional transport and land use modeling. Um, so in short, every part of our current infrastructure system could be impacted, again, depending on what combination of technologies actually appeared and what proportions. Um, I'll touch briefly on transport modeling because I think this helps to illustrate a point that Graham touched on, but also um, one of the interesting points of the work that we did. Um, on the left, you're looking at, um, this is the change in flow. So the um, thickness of the line um, in both of these images basically shows um, a change in flow versus the base case or that dead end scenario, which would be current vehicle technologies in the same base here that we're talking about these future scenarios. Um, and the thickness of the line is how much the change in flow is versus that base case. And green is a positive change, red is a negative change. So you can see here in the um, Fleet Street scenario, our modeling suggests that we could service um, all predicted transport trips in 2046. Um, if the fleet was entirely shared, again, that's not a realistic scenario, but we're thinking through. Um, with only 7% of the vehicles, so um, which is a really interesting finding from a modeling sense um, that actually, you know, without anybody waiting, and, and that really goes to the proportion of time that private vehicles are unused, which we know is really significant at present. So the time that they're spent parked, the time that they spend um, basically in, in non-operative environments, um, that 7% is also at that peak time. So in that peak rush hour and at different times of the day, you actually wouldn't need even that much of the vehicle fleet, which is really interesting. Um, well, this seems like a fantasy, certainly. Um, our slow lane scenario, which was the 50% mix of this fleet street and 50% of our current vehicle technologies, privately owned um, petrol and diesel vehicles, um, that uh, that actually we could reduce the vehicle fleet still by 43%, um, resulting in a 39% improvement to network performance as a result of that reduced congestion. So it's really interesting in terms of the potential um, and the types of potential areas where we might see these technologies really starting to impact on the overall operation of our transport system. But Graham touched on earlier, um, some of the negative downsides. And on the right, you can see um, the scenario that we call private drive, which is where everyone has their own privately um, privately owned um, automated vehicle. Uh, and here we're really pulling out just the MTAVs and you can see in the CBD, um, the significant congestion, and that's a decrease in flow versus actually our own privately driven vehicles at present. 
but actually those empty AVs, because you wouldn't necessarily need to park them in the city, you might choose to send them somewhere else. You might actually even choose to have them roving around for the day um, in order to avoid parking charges. So there's certain, you know, absolute um, implications of each of these different, um, different scenarios themselves. In terms of the overall benefits that we identified through our study, so um, we did identify that there's a potential for really significant increase um, uh, in gross state product um, as a result of the introduction of these um, of these vehicle technologies, um, up to 15 billion uh, or short of that in um, in some of the scenarios that we modeled. Also, potential to really significantly decrease road accidents um, again, depending on the uptake of the vehicles, and that's primarily. Um, as a result of, you know, a lot of road accidents are a result of human error. Again, a hypothesis at the moment is that you could reduce that through the use of automated technologies. Um, and then again, as um, AVs bring a lot more of the ZEV technology, you could also see some of those, those health and environmental benefits as well coming through. Um, AVs and ZEVs are also expected to be up to 97% cheaper for most Victorians. And um, one of the crossover points that we identified in our work was that actually for Victorians that, um, that drive less than 43,000 kilometers per year, it's likely that actually um, ZEVs, but also AVs um, particularly might be, um, might be cheaper for, for those people. And the, the further work on this is actually available within our study, which I will um, put in the chat after this if anyone wants to follow up on, on further detail. Um, in terms of the costs, however, you know, certainly this is not all um, a good news story and it's certainly not without its potential costs. Um, again, Graham um, highlighted the potential that car travel um, could relate to cities becoming more dispersed and certainly more people in peri-urban areas around Melbourne um, would put pressure on productive land and environmentally significant areas, which is not something that we would um, we would advocate for by any means. Housing in outer and greenfield areas can also have higher infrastructure costs, um, and that's something that we are very interested in making sure that we take into the um, into these discussions as well. And you can see on the right here. Um, this is um, a difference in population um, of one of our key scenarios versus the base case and really looking at what the difference from a population dispersal could look like, which is quite significantly different from, um, from that base case. Um, car travel, of course, um, becoming more attractive could also lead to greater congestion, um, depending again on the combination of vehicle types and outcomes that we see coming through, although of course it could also reduce depending on those outcomes of scenarios. It could create new waste streams and we're not necessarily prepared to deal with those either, um, which is an, a, a concern. And then investment specifically, um, we've estimated um, up to 1.7 billion could be required to upgrade mobile networks. Well, automated vehicles can largely operate um, without needing to be connected to a mobile network. It certainly helps to improve the triangulation from their perspective of really understanding where they are on the road. Um, there's obviously other benefits that come from upgrading mobile networks generally, particularly in regional areas, but certainly making sure that, um, that regional Victorians aren't left behind um, in the transition to these kinds of technologies is really important and making sure that the technology is available to ensure that they are also able to participate in some of those benefits are, is, is something that we need to all be keeping in mind. This isn't just a, an urban solution. Um, we estimate up to 250 million might be required for improving line marks and markings and signage, which is one of the key areas that AVs are currently working on, um, and at least 2.2 billion for energy network upgrades, which again, with our energy transition is likely to be required um, at any rate. So our recommendations specifically focused on um, updating transport regulations. We need to be able to allow these vehicles to operate effectively. And Damon touched on that a little bit in his presentation about some of those challenges just on scooters. But, you know, within the broader automated vehicle, you can't underestimate how much effort that is to really make sure that we do that safely. Um, upgrading roads and communication infrastructure progressively to help facilitate increasingly connected and automated vehicles and really to gain the full benefits um, of those technologies. Um, the governments should develop policy and business case guidance. So, you know, the implications, should we see some of these scenarios eventuate in terms of the implications for business cases and how we're projecting and how we're making decisions on our infrastructure is quite significant. So making sure that we have that guidance um, so that's applied consistently across projects is important. Um, again, encouraging more efficient travel behavior through transport network pricing, of course, is something that we would obviously um, advocate for in any um, any environment, but um, but certainly within the context of ensuring that, um, you know, making that transport, making driving, um, that making people pay for the cost of driving appropriately is really important um, and encouraging, um, encouraging appropriate pricing models um, to do so. Um, 
of course, as well, making sure that land use planning helps to encourage um, housing in established areas as much as possible to help address the land use dispersion points that both Graham and I made um, and continue, of course, um, to invest in public and active transport um, in all of our scenarios, public transport and active transport increased um, as a result of increases in population. And, um, and certainly even with a world with um, automated vehicles, we don't see we don't see that overtaking the role of public transport. Um, more information is available on the IV website, um, and there's a few different reports that speak to this, but I'm happy to take any questions, and, um, and like I said, I'll post the link to primary study that I've referenced in the notes. Thank you, Leighton. Thanks, Alison. Thank you very much. This is very detailed presentation, so, so many to absorb. Uh, I think that has <clears throat> I made a clear link between what you presented and one of the question in the chat that talks about given given that if we have autonomous vehicles, then there will be empty driving and people will be going and sending back car. And this question is directed to Graham particularly. So in your presentation, Alison, you said that congestion will be reduced by more than 90%. But um, the question is then if we have empty running, then that will create more congestion. So Graham, do you have any? thought on that? My main strategic thought is that these technology developments have forgotten what the problem is. And I think, you know, there are significant problems for the future of cities. Congestion certainly is one of them. Uh, the, you know, densification of cities, the um, growth of cities as a global phenomenon. And unfortunately, these solutions, so-called solutions, have forgotten that there's a problem. Um, now, the assumptions in the IV modeling uh, adopt operations research theory about intersection weaving of cars without the use of um, traffic lights and also high speed platooning of cars to, to reduce congestion. To my mind, in cities where humans live, that is not feasible. And uh, while it mathematically could be done, what we'd have to do is grid separate every single street in the city. So it's quite impractical. Uh, unless uh, we want to avoid people crossing roads again, and don't forget people are supposed to live in cities. Um, so I, I don't think it's a solution. Also, um, if, if removing human control of driving makes autonomous cars uh, safer, then why are autonomous cars killing people? You know, there is no culture of safety in the autonomous car industry at the moment. Uh, there are no regulations of, of car, autonomous cars. They're very weak. Um, and so let's see some examples of the industry actually trying to achieve that, that, that realistically. So, look, I, I think um, we need more practical solutions that are focused, focused on the problem and will solve the problem. I like what Crystal was saying about our governance and the fact that the governance has actually created problems. And it will continue to do so until we start recognizing that we need to manage solutions into the future. That's very well put, Graham. And that relates to Graham, uh, Graham's point about governance of crystal. We have another question in the chat asking about governance thing. Question is, are we academics uh, uh, better informed about what people need? Uh, than policymakers. So if so, how do we secure a wider share of voice? All right, thanks for the question. And gosh, this comes down to, the, this gets to the core of governance for me. And that is, the answer is no. I mean, academics know some things, policymakers know other things, and the community knows a lot. Um, and one of the, the big issues I find with, with transport studies, transport research, both in policy and in academia, is that we, going back to what Graham said, the pro, it's a problem, so we're so solutions focused and, and, and very much focused on technologies that we lose the human dimensions to what we're trying to do. We lose sense of the built environment and how it's structured and how we might want to structure it into the future. Remember the 20 minute city? Remember those policies? They're really important policies. And for two years, we almost lived those policies because of our lockdown restrictions here. Climate change is something that seems relatively absent in this discussion. 
And I can't understand why that is, apart from the fact that, again, we're focused on the solution technology. If we were to go out into the community, to the different parts of metropolitan Melbourne, to different parts of Australia, and we were to have these conversations with people who are living the problem on a day-to-day -day basis, it would be really interesting to search what would be surfaced for them. Maybe climate change would be absent, but it would be sitting back there somewhere around their future aspirations for their lives and for their children's lives and other members of their community. So I have a question for everyone else. Where is climate change in this discussion and why is it so absent? <laughs> that's, that's a big question to answer, Crystal. Um, we have a couple of questions about e-scooters here and probably Damon is the best person to answer. So Damon, to you is, uh, is the e-scooter program that we trialed here, are the autonomous vehicle or just electric vehicle? Yes, I, I saw that question. I have just typed a short answer, but I can give a slightly longer answer. I think that um, autonomous, you know, what does it mean? And there's also um, automated, what does that mean? And we're seeing that I think previously it's either autonomous or it's not, but there's actually a spectrum. And we're seeing now with newer cars that some of the aspects of their operation are becoming automatic. So you can you know, uh, detect vehicles in other lanes or stay in a lane or, or so on. Uh, with e-scooters, I guess it's a lot, um, uh, an autonomous e-scooter was actually a, a Google um, April Fool's joke a few years ago, one that would drive around and balance on two wheels by itself. But I think that's probably the limitation with e-scooters is that you have a person with two feet standing and balancing on them. But these are tech companies that are running them and there are aspects of them that they are trying to automate already using AI. And some of these other features are things like being able to tell if it's being ridden on the footpath or being able to tell if it has two people on it um, or one very large person or two very small people or being able to tell uh, if it's parked in the right place on the footpath or where it should go. So rather than you know going fully autonomous, I think um, identifying the opportunities again, where they can deliver a public benefit. Um, the companies that we have working with us in Australia are very good, they're responsive, but they wanna see what we want out of it. They also um, are both answering to headquarters in, in Singapore and California. And quite often the things that we want are things that nobody else wants, like uh, helmets for bicycle riders or not being ridden on the footpath. So they're not really part of their global priorities to say, we need to prioritize the development of this in our California office. We need uh, helmets and helmet detection for e-scooters because we're one of only three places in the world that requires it, Canada, Australia, and Israel. Okay, yeah, so it's some sort of autonomous in a sense, right? The answer to, to the question. Um, and that also linked to a question to Alison is about whether you have taken into account micro mobility like e scooter into that scenarios that you have considered. Uh, yeah, there's an easy answer, which is that we didn't actually look at micro mobility, which I meant to type and accidentally clicked on answer live. Um, but I might take the opportunity as well just to address a couple of the other points that have been made um, just around. Um, I think Graham's point about safety is a really critical one and certainly one that, um, you know, we absolutely have to be as a society comfortable with any decisions that we make about new technologies. Right. And and this is always you know, these are always questions are similar to the questions that came in um, when vehicles were first introduced, right? And um, and certainly thinking about that at the moment, you know, far more human-driven vehicles um, kill and injure people than um, that automated vehicles. Does that continue to play out? We have to keep an eye on that, right? And, that, and that's very important to make sure that we feel collectively as society that the risks are worth are worth it, right? And and I guess. In terms of the, um, the the balance, and certainly as we see these technologies emerge overseas, you know, being able to understand what those risks are and are we taking them on is really important. I also just wanted to clarify just a point um, that Graham had made about um, the the flow of traffic and some of the models that we have. We don't actually assume in any of the modeling that was presented that there's actually a free flowing traffic without traffic lights. Um, that, that is obviously something that has been raised, but the modeling that underpins our work does assume that in some of the scenarios where you have um, 
basically entirely automated fleets that you could in theory have um, vehicles traveling closely together. And that's covered um, in detail within the paper itself, but we don't actually assume that there's um, that there wouldn't be any traffic lights. And of course, you know, if any of these technologies we have to make sure that we are accommodating people first. And I think Damon's point about, um, you know, making sure that the city has to come first before we adapt to student technologies, absolutely. You know, we don't want to repeat the mistakes that we've made with previous technologies. And, and we do want to be thinking about this and, and taking, taking the, the potential opportunities. And, and these technologies do open up opportunities for cohorts that previously have had challenges participating in transport, right? And, and, and understanding you know, how this could make a difference to um, a visually impaired person who couldn't previously you know, drive themselves and thinking about how, how a technology, particularly a zero emissions vehicle, plays into that and in the context of the challenge that Crystal's presented about you know, climate change, how are we thinking about the variety of different users of these systems and the people will use them differently and, and responding to those is very important. So I think it's, it's, that, it's that balance and making sure that we are having these thoughtful conversations as a society about how these technologies can be introduced responsibly to, to assist different cohorts, to respond to the challenges that we have, to really balance out those different kinds of, um, of issues that we have without, without taking any one, you know, this is not, not solely a fantastic technology that we should adopt wholeheartedly without any of those limits, but equally we need to consider all technologies and what they can do. And that, you know, a lot of us probably 10 years ago wouldn't have thought about how an e-scooter could fit into our lives, but you know, given some of the results that are coming out from Damon's um, Damon's work and the City of Melbourne's work, you know, a lot of us are actually using them in a way that we might not have thought about. So, so thinking thinking carefully, I think, is a really key element in, in, in keeping people at the forefront of any of these decisions. And another related question to Alison to you: uh, Did you consider uh, carbon emission or cl climate change impact in 2051 in your model? Uh, yeah, so, so there's what did you find? Yes, yeah, so there's quite a lot in the um in the study. We did do one specific um uh piece of work that was focused um entirely on understanding um the implications for um uh for for um emissions and um and the different scenarios are quantified specifically within the within the study. Unsurprisingly, as the transition to zero emissions um emerges, the, the key thing is making sure that we are decarbonizing not only our vehicle technologies, but also the source of the emissions and that we're not just focused on tailpipe and displacing emissions, but certainly that also changes um, the way that we could see our cities evolving as well, that, you know, zero emissions technologies have different characteristics to the technologies of, um, you know, of petrol or diesel vehicles in terms of um, both noise, but also um, also fumes and and carbon carbon emissions, but also other emissions, um, other particulate emissions that we need to think about, and really um, and and those are yeah, covered in a lot of detail, both in the summary report and there's an additional report that sits behind it, which really speaks to the specifics of the differences for emissions in those different scenarios. But yes, you know, if we think about the implications for, um, you know, if we had a shared fleet, for example, of automated vehicles in which the vehicles themselves are being used more efficiently, that obviously contributes to helping to solve the emissions issues that we have as well, in addition to the decarbonization of the fleet itself um, and, and the broader energy grid, importantly. That's great. Um, question to Crystal. Uh, apart from that autonomous vehicle will result in a dispersed cities, uh, longer travel time, would there be any beneficial element in it? Sorry, Lytton, you may have to repeat that first part of that question. Oh, okay, so Sorry. one of the question came like, uh, autonomous vehicle will make the cities bigger, more dispersed, uh, make travel time longer. Apart from that, is there any benefit out of it? Mm, well, <laughs> I can offer my personal view. Uh, look, I think, Longer travel times, in my view, and I can I can I'll have to defer possibly to, to Graham for this question, who might have the data to back it up. But um, if what we're discussing, if the problem is that of mobility, freedom of mobility, and absolute accessibility at all times of the day for all people, what we might find ourselves, we might find ourselves in a situation whereby our infrastructural load will increase as well. Our carbon dependency will increase, although point emissions might be decreased because they'll be electric. Um, I don't see that resolving one of the problems that again, I'll name, 
climate change um, and 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 you know ever more mobility, which has produced climate and sorry congestion and other problems for our cities, including who has access to our public streets. And, and who uh, whose safety is really at risk when we're talking about safety. So my short answer is I don't think dispersed cities and longer commutes is, is the solution to whatever the problem is we're discussing here. Um, but I'll, I'll defer to Graham because no doubt I'm sure he has something to say. Yeah, on this I, question too. I, I'd like to have Graham's view as well before I go to another question to Graham. Graham, would you like to add anything? Well, I completely agree. Um, why would we want to travel for further? Um, the truth is that autonomous cars have let that happen and we can even be productive, we can do things in them. Um, now, there are some fantasies around that business people will love all that. Uh, and forever when we see these vehicles, there's people in suits in them. What about everybody else? You know, what have you got kids to take to school? Um, it just doesn't make any sense for people to travel further. It's just gonna cost more it means that uh, activities are further away from where you are. And I just don't think, uh, you know, a, a net zero city is not more a dispersed city. It is one which is consolidated, where we share travel more um, and where activities are closer together and where we can walk and cycle to local activities in our area. So I, I, I just think it's the exact opposite of what we need to be heading for. Okay. And a quick question. Just, there can I just question. add something very quickly to that? We yes. talked a lot about this when we were writing the future transport uh, chapter in the transport strategy. And I think that um, when you tie it into experiences we've seen with other things like Airbnb and Car Next Door and so on, and it's fantastic to see the work that Ivy has done to map all of this out because uh, we were just talking about it, theorizing, and it's not just, we're still assuming people will have one car and that what will the kids do? Well, quite clearly, families will buy one for their kid. Now we're seeing kids getting mobile phones before they even turn 10. They'll get, a, they'll get an autonomous car and it will drive them around everywhere. And then also we'll see people, you know, how far away will people drive? We think, oh, people will get up in the morning and then, you know, brush their teeth in the car. Well, they'll probably go to bed in the bed that plugs into their car that will then leave their house eight hours before they have to go to work. So the car becomes the bed that is connected to their house. So it, then we'll see that people who can afford to perhaps buy 10 or 20, as we saw with apartment buildings and Airbnb, that someone will start to buy a fleet of these things and run them like Airbnbs. And then if we don't have something like road user pricing, if it's not cheaper to uh, to drive the, sorry, if the cost of parking the car is not measured up with the cost of driving the car, then you'll have all of these empty cars just floating around uh, in the off season, just the same as you've got all of these empty Airbnbs and these apartment buildings. So there's a lot of parallels happening, but it could be five times worse than I think the scenarios that I've heard um, in this session already. Maybe a quick answer from you. is. Will the e-scooter program replace the bike shared program? Uh, so back to reality for me with this question, I think that uh, we're seeing a lot of people who haven't got the experience of riding bikes, riding e-scooters. I think that's why they're on the footpath at the moment. I think everyone in Melbourne is on their L's. They don't have the confidence. They're all still trying it out for the first time. Um, but because of the speed differential, because e-scooters are different and weird and more dangerous, even though they may not be, um, the, it, the speed limit for scooters is slower than for bikes. So for somebody who's proficient, who knows where they want to go, they will make the decision to get on a bike. But as a general rule, the e-scooters are four times more popular and arguably four times more profitable for the companies. So we are seeing a much bigger spike and demand in the e-scooter usage than we have in the bikes. Perhaps that's just because a normal person walking down the street who would never get on a bike seems quite happy to get on an e-scooter. But these are the types of things that we're finding out through this trial. Question is specific to Alison um, about what advice did you give to Victorian government in terms of the changes required to legitimize uh, planning for increasing the number and length of motorized journeys. I mean, what was your advice to the government? 
what was our advice to your government about the length of the journeys themselves? Yeah, so increasing infrastructure needs probably in the short. Yeah, so we've um so two of our specific recommendations that we had within this paper, um, and more broadly within our strategy, them you know genuinely um, talk to um, thinking about how these types of technologies impact on planning values and really um, and really having that question, you know, existing planning policy in Plan Melbourne um, specifically suggests targeting seventy percent um, of new new builds being in um, established areas versus thirty percent in growth areas, um, and certainly that's something that we um, you know we we try to assist government in determining how to accommodate that. Um, we think one of the main things from a planning perspective is is trying to um, think about the specific uh, individuals that are involved in the planning system and thinking about creating planning flexibility for them, as well as really understanding, you know, what are the planning policies that should um, either support or constrain these types of technologies to be able to, um, to really reflect the overall um, objectives that we have as society. So um, we do have two specific planning related recommendations within the report itself. Um, but but more broadly, you know, this the, the broader questions about planning and dispersal are um, are fundamental to all of our considerations around actually what kind of a city, what kind of a state do we want going forward, and how do we make sure that infrastructure um, leads where appropriate, responds where necessary, um, and that planning controls work in an integrated way with with that kind of um, with those decisions, right? And 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 really thinking carefully about exactly how those decisions are going to play out in practice is um, is something that we spend quite a lot of time thinking about and, and working with our colleagues across government to try and address. Does that answer the question, Leighton? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Um, I, again, a governance question to Crystal. Um, do you think we'll be needing any licensing requirements, drug testing requirement, or, or things like that when we'll have autonomous vehicle? Oh gosh, um, I I don't I don't I can't predict the future. Um, but <laughs> I, I I think that's a really interesting question. I don't have the knowledge to respond. Um, again, when I'm thinking about this future, I'm thinking about this future with active transport and public transport. Uh, and at the very least, shared mobility at the center. Um, and I, 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 I will continue to strive for that, both in my teaching to the next generation of policymakers and planners, as well as in the research that I conduct. But I also recognize that we do live in a very car dependent and car hungry society and that the pragmatic part of my brain needs to engage with those other questions. Um, but I may defer uh, any speculative answers that others might have in response to that really interesting question. Yeah, so that car dependency brings a question to Graham. Uh, one question in the chat is about free public transport and put a specific example of Boston, yeah, Graham. Do you think we would have something like that? Uh, well, um, if it's logical, I would think it's a good idea, but I'd like to understand well, how it is logical and what problem it's going to solve. One of the rationales for free public transport is to help uh, disadvantaged people. And I uh, led a conference of all of the leading groups dealing with people who had problems in disadvantage. And, um, their big problem was they didn't have any public transport and whether it was free or not didn't really matter. Um, and they very much said they'd rather have the money for free public transport to get public transport. So um, there's one. Also, um, if we had free public transport, we'll increase ridership by around about 20 percent. We have free public transport, for example, in the city of Melbourne, where we have these scooters operating, um, taking demand away from the, the, um, the trams. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, I'd like to see what the reason for it was. 20% uh, growth in public transport usage is nothing compared to the environmental concerns and problems we have for cities. It is not going to make a very big dent in traffic congestion in cities. It's not going to help the social problems in cities. It's not going to help the uh, economic development of cities. Uh, so given that it doesn't solve any problems, I don't think it's a good idea. 
Okay. Overall, so <laughs> this is probably frustrating answer ground for me. Uh, I I thought maybe a pre public transport would make our cities better. But anyway, a uh, question to uh, Alison. Uh, we heard about it flying taxi services in Melbourne, uh, but that now nobody's talking about that. There is a question like that. Uh, do you think it would be a reality? Yeah, that's a, a really interesting question. Um, certainly, uh, so our study that we did really just focused on the the road transport. Um, you know, I think I think I would um, I certainly wouldn't want to say in a recorded public forum that I think it would never happen because I think I would be you know I, I would be at risk of becoming one of those people that um, where you get the soundbite of of somebody going actually this person said it was never going to happen so ne never say never certainly it's not without its challenges. Um, and certainly um, thinking about, you know, the social equity, the price point at which, you know, these things would happen is, is a particular challenge and really understanding um, air traffic is, is one of the fundamental questions, right? And how do you do it safely? And, you know, are we going to be in, um, in, in a fifth element style future where we have, you know, highways in the air um, at some point in the future? I, I like Crystal do not yet have um, have a crystal ball to tell me about exactly what what's going to happen. But I would say never never say never. And certainly, um, you know, I, I don't think that it's um, uh, that it's an impossible future by any means. Um, and, and there could be certain circumstances under which it was introduced. Um, if I just add to the last question, um, this is one point that Graham and I agree on um, absolutely around. Um, you know, around free transport, um, you know, in theory, it sounds great. And on an individual level, it sounds fantastic. The challenge is really that it doesn't help us to send appropriate economic signals to individuals to allow them to make decisions about how best to use the public transport network. Um, and so from our perspective, and, and there's quite a lot of work that Ivy has done in this space, really thinking about, you know, thinking thoughtfully about both um, time of day pricing that helps people to make decisions. So you don't have to travel during the times at which we have, you know, peak use of our public transport that actually makes us, that helps us to make better use of our existing infrastructure and where we can make better use of our existing infrastructure we don't have to invest in new infrastructure and it's better for everybody and so sending price signals is a good way of actually helping people to say actually i don't need to travel at 8 30 on a monday actually i'm very happy to wait and travel at 9 30. that actually helps us overall as a society to avoid some of those costs um, we're also really um, strong advocates for mode differentiated pricing and thinking about how different modes actually um, respond better to different pricing. So again, lots and lots of work out there if that's um, if that's of interest, just to explain some of the more su the subtleties about that, but absolutely Graham and I are very much on the same page on that one. Yeah, okay. Um, next question, I'll go to Damon, probably he would be the right person to answer that one. Um, putting example from Paris, uh, one question was in the chat about removing parking and car parking spaces and putting more active transport. Uh, so a major mode shift in Paris. Uh, what is the city of Melbourne's plan in relation to that? Sorry, the city council's plan? Yeah. Yeah, so um, this is something that uh, it's a very, very hot topic in the city of Melbourne at the moment. Uh, we have a lot of focus on parking. Uh, every time you know we had COVID, we've given away free parking. It's a very large amount. Uh, sorry, it's a very it's a very big source of revenue for the city. So it's also um, kind of something very difficult when you want to make changes. But when you take a step back and you have a look at what's happening in the city in terms of car parking supply, it is a very um, the on-street parking supply is a very small percentage of the overall supply of car parking in the city. But in many other cities around the world, you have the city government that runs a lot of the off-street car parks and the on-street supply. Well, this was the case, I think, in the city of Melbourne up until the 50s or 60s, but slowly uh, the city of Melbourne has sold those car parks off. So we, I think, have only two small car space car parks. One of them is in the office building next door to me here. Um, and then the majority of them are being run um, privately. So there's this constantly this tension between um, people driving to the city 
everyone has a parking ferry sitting on their shoulder, you will find a parking space. And the amount of supply that is on street just isn't there for all those people who want to park in those spaces. They, um, they have estimated that generally speaking in any downtown area in any capital city that a third of all of the traffic on any street is just circling around looking for a spot so more and more so we are trying to reduce the the impacts of that um, and the city of melbourne has had some slightly differential parking policies to the rest of victoria and i think the issue that we have in victoria is that for the majority of people who live in metropolitan melbourne you can drive and park anywhere you want. You can park on the grass, you can double park, you can you know, park in the driveway and stick out and block the entire footpath. And then the majority of municipalities around Melbourne beyond the inner city, that's tolerated. But, and these are the people who drive through uh, the city of Melbourne all the time. And then when they do get parking tickets, they get upset about that. When they do have to pay for parking, they get upset about that. When they can't find a spot on the street and then have to go off street and pay a higher rate, they get upset about that. But uh, the city of Melbourne um, being so small uh, is able to kind of withstand that. And we have been reducing the on-street parking supply every year, you know, by a certain percentage. I'm not sure of the exact number, but 5% or so. And we're constantly giving away on-street parking spaces to widened footpaths, to trees, um, to, uh, to bike lanes, to parklets. And it's just this constant cycle of us continuing to do that, reducing the dependence on that on-street supply. But you still have a lot of people who are now older in Melbourne, who remember the time when they could drive to anywhere in the CBD and park whenever they wanted for as long as they wanted, pretty much. And those people still live and exist within our political space and they call our TV stations and radio stations uh, and write to the paper. And that puts a lot of political pressure on all of the projects that we have to deliver in the city. At the moment, everyone has been too scared to touch parking. Uh, the transport strategy doesn't go into a lot of detail, but it does set some principles. And after COVID and after all the chopping and changing that has occurred, there is now going to be some work coming out of the council that is basically just going to be a stock take of what are all the prices. Currently, they're mixed up all over the spot. What will we or won't we remove a parking space for and what will we put in its space? Um, but again, technology is helping us to a small degree, but it's just fundamental basic principles, I think, of saying, what is the city for? What is this space for? Why do you need to park here when there's a building here that will fit 500 or 1,000 parking spaces that's habitually empty? So there's a huge opportunities to clean up uh, that space um, in on-street parking when you look at the bigger picture and you look at off-street parking and you look at the city. No, probably there's there's... A very good answer, um, Devon. And a million dollar last question, we are uh, almost close to an end, is how could we improve drastically mobility and congestion within our cities, promote active mode shift, redesign our urban life, et cetera, ban cars? What is the question asked to Graham? But uh, I would like to have views from all of our panel members. How could, is there any quick fix at all? If so, what is that? There's no quick um, fix. But I think we should be looking for a future based around high volume shared mobility. Um, I think automation has its role. I've mentioned that today the world is, the autonomous passenger transport world is dominated by autonomous trains. There is an option there to improve access and we need to have more solutions like that. We need to encourage local travel. We need higher density, uh, attractive, uh, productive inner city areas. And we need to discourage urban sprawl. And we need to discourage car use because it's just environmentally inefficient. So uh, my view of the future is not car based at all. Any other thought, Alison, Crystal, Demon? I think um, just, you know, the question about drastically improving mobility and congestion um, is really, you know, that that is a very, it's a transport focused question, but I think, um, you know, Damon, again, said it really well in terms of, you know, our cities are places for people and thinking about how people experience our cities and, um, 
and, and whether people really want to, um, to experience cities in the same way that they have. You know, COVID-19 has done, um, has changed our, our worldviews in many, many different ways, but certainly, um, you know, as Crystal said earlier, thinking about how, um, how people have chosen to live locally um, has, has really changed in the, last, um, in the last couple of years and really understanding the implications of that and how a different, different urban forms can help to respond to individual choice about where they want to live and work, but how we actually help to do that. And I think, you know, from the transport perspective, you know, we're thinking about trying to move people to the places that they want to be. What are those places to be, you know, that they want to be aren't necessarily central city places, you know, but, but really thinking about that mix of, as we talked about earlier, land use planning, um, infrastructure provision, um, support of that individual choice, but also helping to, to respond flexibly to those, I think is the key to really um, addressing those two challenges at once. Lutin, can I jump in here with just a quick reflection, very quick. Um, I just say, um, I'm like, Graham, the future for me is not car centric. And my, my final thought here is you need to be political. This whole transition, the future is going to occur through a political prism and we can't be agnostic to that. Uh, we need to be intentional, we need to be aware and we need to understand the different ways in which that politics is playing out and it's not just party politics. I teach a subject called urban transport politics at Melbourne University. Come over and have a chat with me. This is something, we, you know, presumably we had 140 people interested in attendance here today, all interested in this question and no doubt are interested in a public, in, in public good outcome, whatever that might look like. So this is a really powerful starting point. So uh, get political, get active, understand the politics of transport planning. Damon, do you have any word to say? Uh, I have a very short answer to this last question. I think uh, I'm very optimistic and I think we just have to keep doing what we're doing. Things are going in the right direction. Uh, whenever anyone says ban cars in the city, I think that the simple thing we need to do is we had one particular mode of transport for a very long period of time that was taking up more than its fair share at traffic lights, in the width of the road, at intersections, in buildings, in every regard. And I think now that we're having a much more holistic view of planning, if cars took up only the space they were entitled to when everyone else was still able to get their fair share, and if they fully paid their way, then they would probably find their correct place in the whole integrated transport system. So I would say rather than banning them, which would leave just empty streets, just stop giving them more than their fair share and that just means that we need to do our work and figure out who needs what in what regard and do proper integrated transport planning. That's a great to, way to end, Devon. Thank you. We need to be political crystal and we need to give fair share to every, every road users, right? Uh, that brings to the conclusion of our event. Thanks for joining everyone. I would encourage you all to continue the conversation and join other festival of urbanism events. Uh, please head to the website uh, showing here. And if you haven't registered for any other events, please uh, do so. Thanks everyone for joining. Uh, you have a great evening. Thank you. So thanks, Aiden.